uh, Dr. Yasmin Hurd is the director of the Addiction Institute within the Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System and is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. She's an internationally renowned neuroscientist whose research examines the neurobiology of drug abuse and related psychiatric disorders. And she has been inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. I've asked her to come talk today about novel potential non-opioid treatments based on neuroscience. So basically treatment, treatment options that can get people away from opioids. Uh, it's a little after 11 right now. We have her until noon. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Hurd. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Let me just share my screen. Thanks, Grace, for um, including me in your program. Clearly today, uh, my talk is going to um, cover the science of, well, it really based on the neurobiology of what we know about opioid addiction. And can that science help guide us to developing new treatments. And I mean, obviously in this audience, I don't have to, you know, deliver, um, deliver the, the point about the opioid crisis from that, you know, started off with trying to manage pain that then people switch to, you know, the heroin, and now we have fentanyl crisis um, altogether. Um, and this is the foundation for me. I, as Chris mentioned, I am the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai, which actually covers one of the largest clinical addiction footprints in the country with over 6,000 patients treated um, for opiate use disorder. And the economic burden for our society in general is humongous. I mean, it's over like, you know, trillions of dollars a year. And for us in the medical side, it, opioid addiction costs over like three times the, the, the amount of money to treat than other disorders as well. And we are still in this epidemic of overdose death uh, with over 140, 30 people dying daily, even though we are in this pan, you know, the pandemic. And altogether, the issues that I'll talk to you about today um, and that you guys all know as well is that you know the treatments for substance use disorder, especially for opiate use disorders, even though those that are there um, and have shown to be beneficial, they're not really used or often not suitable. And during the COVID pandemic, um, unfortunately, the use of drugs have gone up a lot because of the stress and social isolation. And you know we see that a lot of the use that has gone up um, relates again to opioids, not surprisingly, fentanyl and heroin. And as I mentioned before, the epidemic that we still have for drug overdose deaths that are mainly driven by opioids. And last year, and during the, the, pan, the, the pandemic period, we've had even more people die of drug overdoses. But those numbers are kind of, not kind of, they are lost in the bigger pandemic um, that we, we have. So I, I will say, um, I'm just giving a general background now, and then um, I'll talk about the science and I please feel free to um, interrupt me. You don't have to necessarily wait till the end. But I'm um, just giving this overview about, you know, um, the, our endogenous opioid system. So we have opioid receptors throughout the brain and the receptors in the parts of the brain um, that are critical for reward, pain perception, and so on. Um, that's one of the, the, the reasons why we're in this, um, this epidemic. I keep going in my brain once to say pandemic, but the pandemic is COVID. And, you know, so, and I'll go through some of the brain regions, but for um, reward and addiction, we um, will focus a lot on areas such as the nucleus accumbens and our cortex for aspects um, dealing with, with pain perception. I'm not gonna cover pain neurobiology today um, because it's more about a, um, the addiction, but one of the things that as I mentioned, why um, you know we have these high overdose deaths due to like the opiate receptors in the brainstem in those regions that control um, respiration, and so that's why you know a lot of people, um, in terms of what co contributes to the overdose deaths. So opioids like heroin and its metabolite morphine, they target our the, these opiate receptors that are throughout our bodies, and for the large part. 
um, it focuses on the muopid receptor. And the muopid receptor is that opioid receptor that mediates a lot of the rewarding effects that our natural endogenous um, um, opioids um, also interact with. And the, this muopid receptor, most of the medications today are focused on that. So as you know, methadone, it's a, a muopid receptor agonist. And the thing that I, you know, people don't realize perhaps is that methadone has been around for a very long time. It was first introduced in 1964 and it has saved millions of lives. You know, the issue with, um, for us in trying to address an epidemic is the fact that most of the medications that are used for opioid use disorder are themselves opioids. So you know, since, since methadone, yes, we've had buprenorphine and suboxone, which are, um, uh, they're still opioid agonists and suboxone is a combination of um, buprenorphine and naloxone, uh, which is an, an antagonist. So even though we've had new medications per se, they're still targeting the same opioid receptor and naltrexone or Narcan, you know, um, which are antagonists to try to block, knock, opioids off of the muopid receptor. So the issue that we have that even for these opioid uh, medications that are there, only about 20% of the people who need um, treatment actually receive it. And this comes through because of many reasons. I mean, a large part is stigma um, because, you know, the stigma of addiction, and we can talk about that, but a lot of people don't seek the help that they need because of the stigma. Also, because the medications themselves are opioids, many people and there are many treatment programs who say, you know, you shouldn't be on that. That's just a drug itself. And methadone is a drug itself and, you know, uh, a, an addictive drug itself and buprenorphine and so on. But they do, as I said, their harm reduction strategy and the harm reduction strategy is not a bad thing in terms of keeping people alive. Unfortunately, because they are themselves opioids and have an addictive uh, have addictive potential, the agonist, it also means that there's a lot of governmental regulations. So you know, um, for clinicians working with these with these medications to treat their patients, there's a lot of oversight by the government for um, for for um, treating with these opioid agonists. So, you know, the question has come to me in terms of why is there a barrier when there are a lot of papers published about the science of the biology of, of addiction, yet still those, those science-based um, quote unquote treatments have not really made it to um, practical use. And, oh, this is just to emphasize that once again, in terms of when you look at um, opiate use disorder, like all substance use disorders, is about a cycle. You know, people, the intoxication, and um, when people uh, relapse, they go through a detox period, um, and then they're given, um, as I said, you know, opioid agonists and other supportive things that they may need. Um, often, you know, that's the same opioids that are used also to try to mitigate, to reduce their craving, and therefore their drug-seeking behaviors but inver invariably people relapse and the cycle continues. And this is a thing. And as I mentioned that the opioid system has been the primary target for medications development. And that's one of the things that, you know, I wanna talk with you um, today about in how do we move forward in the field by using science? And a large part of my work in terms of trying to find alternative um, strategies is going back to the biology of what is really opioid, um, what does opioid addiction quote unquote mean to the brain? We, we focus in large part on the primary pharmacological actions of drugs. So for example, you know, as I said, for opioids, they, they bind to the muopid receptor to trigger their reward or their, um, to alleviate pain. But those are the pharmacological actions. With a substance use disorders, we're talking about a chronic disorder. Um, there are things that happen in the brain over time to make the person require that, you know, really need that, that, that drug in order to survive really. So the strategy that I have employed is 
actually going back to the human brain. Can we learn something about the human brain that can inform our preclinical animal models that together we can find new neurobiological targets perhaps that we could then bring to clinical studies. So I'm gonna tell you about three lines of, of, of research that I think has promise for the future. Um, I, I'll, end, I'll leave the one that is more most further along um, to the end, but I'll start with what do we know about the human brain? And the first two relates to epigenetics. And I'm gonna come back to like, defining epigenetics. And like I said, please, you know, um, stop me at any time. So unfortunately, as I said, you know, earlier, um, opioid use disorder, there's a high mortality. In, and so we have a brain bank collection. And so for me, the question is, can we actually study the molecular changes in the human brain to be able to guide um, developing um, novel treatments? And when I first started, many people told me it's, you know, it's impossible to do these molecular studies in the human brain. It was really tough to get by even from the scientific community, but we proved and others as well that you can actually get important neurobiological insights from actually doing molecular studies in the human brain, not just relying on animal models. Um, I mentioned like just briefly some of the neurobiology of addiction, but I just in, a, in the schematic overview, just again, tell you, you know, like the nucleus accumbens is this part of the brain region called the striatum. And this ventral part of the striatum is very important for like reward expectation, goal-directed behavior. The dorsal parts of the striatum is important for habit, the, the compulsivity. Um, and these regions are highly studied in addiction um, biology. So too, um, when we started studying the human brain, especially with neuroimaging, we could see that one of the things that's um, uh, brain circuits that are significantly impacted by um, in, in people with a substance use disorder is their prefrontal cortex. That part of the brain that's really important for cognitive control, motivational drive, cognitive flexibility. And so a lot of research started to um, look into you know, cortical function as well. But importantly, you can look in cortical function even in the striatum because the cortex regulates. So our cognitive control will, um, our, our, our cognitive circuits produces control on these subcortical regions so that we can try to dampen aspects of, you know, reward expectation and habits and so on. So when we look in, we can do a number of things in the human brain, like I said, on a molecular level. And here we can look at thousands of genes, for example, in the striatum, in the nucleus accumbens. And we then um, use computational strategies to give us some insights into the pattern of how these genes are expressed and how these genes even uh, are part of networks that communicate and see whether or not there are differences in heroin abusers from um, regular, um, from control individuals who died for the most part from like, you know, heart attacks or something like that. And you don't have to be a computational biologist. You can actually see, even though we do pay them a lot <laughs> to do all the higher math, um, that you can see that there's a significant difference in the gene expression patterns in, in, in heroin users as compared to control. And where those changes are were interesting for us because as I said, in the field, we've mainly focused on, let us look at the opioid, um, the, our endogenous opioid system, our endogenous opioid receptors, our endogenous opioid peptides. But when you just look in an agnostic manner in the, the here, the, the accumbens, the striatum of a person with a heroin use disorder, we saw that there are really profound changes in the glutamatergic system, meaning that, that the, the cortical input that regulates the striatum, that this system is significantly impacted in, in individuals with heroin use disorder. Also, we saw that there were these profound changes in genes related to epigenetics. And I'm gonna come in terms of what is epigenetics? And I think now um, this term, perhaps many in our society have started to understand. So we know that genetics, we inherit the DNA sequence from our parents, that doesn't change. However, the environment and environmental factors like drug use can change how, the, how these genes are turned on and off. 
And this is epigenetics. It's, it's not changing the DNA sequence, but it can change the shape of the DNA and control gene expression. And this is um, uh, an essential aspect of um, epigenetics. And there are many different epigenetic modifications, those that actually uh, put tags directly onto the DNA or the DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins they're called and these tails that um, it, it'll put tags on these tails to once again, um, genes can, areas of the genes can either be closed or they can force these, these parts of these genes to be open. And whether it's closed or open will determine whether or not genes are turned off or on. So in one way, the environment that puts these tags onto our DNA can change even your what your your the blueprint of your genet, your 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 genetic blueprint. So what do we see? I'm not going to give you guys because you know obviously you're not the you know the scientist group. But we saw that there was a this dysregulation, as I said, in the brains in the stratum of um, people with um, heroin use disorders of these epigenetic remodelers. And what it meant is that it it correlated directly with a number of the glutamatergic impairments. And this correlation between these epigenetic marks and these glutamatergic genes actually directly correlated to the number of years of heroin use. And we can also replicate that in an animal model because now the whole goal is if we can, what we find in the human and humans are obviously extremely complex um, they have many different things that they may consume. They've had different life um, trajectories, but an animal model, we know exactly how much drug they have. And so we can have animals actually self-administer heroin. And we could see that they, it changes these epigenetic uh, modifications in the same places in the genome, um, targeting these glutamatergic related um, regulation. And this is really important. And this is important in terms of what type of epigenetic changes that we saw. So it's not that there is a, that heroin is inducing these huge epigenetic changes um, indiscriminately. There were specific epigenetic um, modifiers that were changed. So normally you have these enzymes that put on these tags onto your DNA. You have um, other, um, uh, other mechanisms that read these tags. And then you have other mechanisms, um, enzymes that take the tags off the DNA. It's actually a reversible system. And where we saw that um, heroin um, was leading to these epigenetic dysregulation relates to these air readers there that bind to these acetylated lysines on the DNA. And the thing that's interesting with them is that these changes we know from the cancer field. So cancer, I always say is a, are disorders, are epigenetic disorders because it's epigenetic gone awry. Um, cells start to grow where they shouldn't because of epigenetic uh, modifications. And the cancer field has actually been developing medications that target these, um, these readers where the specific readers are called them BET, these bromo domain, they're called an extra terminal um, um, domain, these complexes. In the cancer field, they've been um, developing these drugs that inhibit these readers. And so we can say, can we leverage the, the medications that are being developed for, for cancer in the, um, for addiction? And indeed, when we look at these inhibitors, we could actually reduce heroin um, self-administration behavior in the animals, either if we put it directly into their striatum, but obviously that's not a treatment we'd use in humans. And we were able to see on a peripheral systemic administration of these inhibitors, we could actually decrease their self-administration. So we know that these epigenetic changes that we see with heroin may be targeted for um, as a treatment. The second strategy that we're looking at based on science comes back still to the epigenetics because the data that I showed you earlier was focused on the glutamate related um, changes that we saw. But when we just look at our epigenome in an unbiased manner, just where in our genes are opened or closed or where in our cells are open or closed in, uh, in, gene, in neurons and non-neuronal cells, in heroin users, and we were able to actually look at that. 
And we could see that the most significant epigenetic change in people um, with heroin use, uh, that died of heroin overdose was a gene called FIN. And FIN is fascinating because it comes back once again to this glutamatergic dysregulation because it sits directly at the synapse and regulates this glutamatergic transmission. But it's also interesting because FIN is also a part of phosphorylating this, it's called this microtubule protein that many people in our society would know, even if they're not sci scientists, called tau. And it phosphorylates this tau. And phosphorylated tau, hyperphosphorylated tau, is a pathological feature that we see in many neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, we were able to see that the brain, in the brains of heroin users, that they actually have hyperphosphorylated tau. And it's not that I'm saying that they have developed Alzheimer's, but the, the cognitive aspects that relates to hyperphosphorylated tau may be part of what we're seeing, why we see that people with um, heroin use have these hyperphosphorylated tau. We could also replicate that in our animal model, that it's opioids that are inducing this hyperphosphorylated tau. Again, it's interesting. Well, here it's just that we could knock down the gene in the striatum um, of these animals and decrease their heroin self-administration behavior. But once again, the thing that's important is about medication development because there are medications that actually are being developed for these neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's that actually targets FIN and these FIN inhibitors. And so can these FIN inhibitors also be effective potentially for opioid addiction? And indeed we let animals self-administer heroin. In fact, we make that very hard for them and they still self-administer heroin and then gave them this FIN inhibitor. And during that time, it reduces their heroin self-administration behavior. So, and when we're trying to develop medications, especially for addiction, we wanna make sure it's not gonna be indiscriminate and every aspect of their life is in, that could be rewarding is impacted, such as food. And when you give them the FIN inhibitor, um, it doesn't change their, for example, food self-administration. So it's specific to their heroin self-administration. So our, our goal to target epigenetic and synaptic regulators, such as um, the, some of the, the, the strategies that I showed you for the medication development, that's what we're trying to put into the clinical trials pipeline. And I will, um, I will uh, tell you how that has been going because it comes back to some aspect even of stigma. So I just basically said what this is, is it, you know, emphasizes that when you look in the brains of people who have a heroin use disorder, what is disrupted long-term that relates to their um, years of use and to the neural circuits relevant to synaptic plasticity um, related to cortical function is these, are these changes in epigenetic and synaptic dysregulation, as I said, linked to their glutamatergic pathology. And it does provide a, a targets for treatment development. So the last part, based on science actually, but um, comes back to um, some aspect that is not based on science in our society today, cannabinoids. And we have a lot of people and anecdotal um, um, discussions based on you know, this changing socio-political landscape around cannabis. So the question is, and for many people, how can we um, reduce opioid addiction and reduce pain. And many people have been um, with the legalization of, of cannabis throughout our country in many states, both for recreational and medicinal use, people are trying to make the decision, should they continue using opioids to manage their, you know, um, like methadone um, to manage their opioid addiction or even for pain management and perhaps try cannabis instead. And, you know, this is really important because when we talk about cannabis, cannabis is a very complex plant with over 140 cannabinoids that have different degrees of, of psychopharmacal activity. And most of the, the, the cannabis that's consumed has actually high amounts of THC, which is the, the most prominent psychoactive 
um, cannabinoid that leads to the, the reward and the high that people have when they take cannabis. But there's a huge difference between, sorry, um, THC and other cannabinoids. And another cannabinoid that has gotten a lot of play in our society in recent years is cannabidiol, CBD. And so it's everywhere, as you know, coffee or burgers, everything. But there's a very big difference and, and THC and CBD are very, very different in regard to reward. T THC induces reward, CBD does not. And it relates obviously to the intoxication. CBD doesn't induce intoxication. They have, um, many of our patients will tell us they take, they you know use THC because to decrease their anxiety. But actually most of the THC that they consume are high dose and actually exacerbate their, their anxiety. Um, while CBD, um, decreases anxiety in a number of studies. And the side effects are also um, different where um, THC has much more, um, you know, in fact, negative effect on short-term memory, judgment, motor coordination, while CBD um, does not, and um, we can talk about what CBD does. But So when we look in our animal models, um, I look at the developmental effects of THC, and that's how we got into the CBD world. And invariably, we would see that adults with, for example, adolescent THC exposure, they would self-administer more heroin. But when we looked at CBD, we were surprised that it, we saw that a different thing. It actually decreased heroin-seeking behavior. And this is important because when we're trying to develop um, treatments for substance use disorder, what is the key that drives the continued cycle of addiction? It's the craving, it's the, the anxiety that triggers the relapse. And it's usually aspects of stress or cues in the environment. And when animals self-administer um, heroin, for example, they freely self-administer, but we will pair something in their environment with them taking the drug. So for example, a light might go on or an odor. And when they, um, so over time, like humans, they associate the certain environmental cues with um, getting the drug. And if you just show them that cue, even though they're not getting the drug at a later time, they'll start pressing away the lever. And that's what we call heroin seeking or drug seeking and CBD reduced that. So as I mentioned, you know, um, for me, the, what we see in opioid abuse is this glutamatergic dysregulation. And we could see the same thing in our animal models. And so, and animals that had this dysregulation in glutamate following um, heroin self-administration CBD actually normalized that. And it normalized a number of other things related to synaptic um, plasticity. So we conducted a clinical trial with CBD, double-blinded, randomized, and placebo control. And this is really critical in science because there's a lot of, uh, or it's very critical, especially for cannabinoids that are being touted with a lot of, as I said, these anecdotal things, because many people want you know, cannabis to work. So um, having placebo control studies are, 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 are key. And in con look, conducting these studies, we looked at craving since that's what we saw in our animal models was our drug seeking was really in, um, critical. We showed them drug cues. And also it's, it's critical, as I said, because that's what triggers um, relapse and that's what we need to really develop medications for. And so when we gave people, um, we showed people a heroin cues and they had received placebo, they craved. And CBD reduced that. One of the things our animal model had also shown was that CBD actually, weeks after its last administration was still affected, effective at reducing uh, heroin seeking behavior. And we saw that in our human subjects as well. A week later when we brought them back to the, to the group and um, CBD was still reducing their, their craving. Also in re relation to anxiety, which triggers relapse often, we saw that in those individuals that had placebo, they were more anxious and CBD reduced their anxiety. And similarly, a week after their final CBD administration, CBD was still reducing their, the Q-induced anxiety. It's not just only on a subjective um, level that CBD was having an impact. We could also see physiologically so when people were um, shown a drug cue, their cortisol levels went up, their stress hormone levels, and CBD reduced that. It also did the same for you know, the drug cues, cue induced um, elevation of their heart rate, CBD reduced that. So it's not, um, 
there's definitely hope in terms of cannabidiol based on some of the work that we've seen and, and other groups have seen as well. And, you know, but we're still right now trying to understand the, the, the best delivery system, the dosing, the regimen that best um, is critical for developing um, CB, CBD. But it's, I have to emphasize, you know, that cannabis is not medicine. As I just mentioned, there are so many different cannabinoids. And one of the things that we see is that when we talk about the risks and the therapeutic benefits of cannabis, it's really about the risk and therapeutic benefits of cannabinoids. So for, can for substance use disorders, we see that um, THC often exacerbates it. We can talk about harm redu reduction strategies, but it also, you know, THC dose matters and it can also en enhance psychosis and, and as I told you, this an anxiety and so on. While it's CBD that we see reduces opioid um, uh, craving anxiety and a few other studies have shown the same thing for other substances as well. So it's really important that, um, you know, that people understand that, that cannabis by itself is not um, the, the cure for opioid addiction. And so I told, showed you like, you know, three strategies that we, we based on science that we were trying to move towards clinical trial. But it's, it's important to emphasize that, you know, unfortunately moving science-based um, research into human studies and eventually new treatment, it's usually, it's very low percentage, but I'm still optimistic. Um, and I'm, I'm optimistic for a number of ways because what we see that's changed in the brains of, of people with perineal disorders are some neurobiological features that are shared with other disorders for which medications are, may already exist that can be repurposed, just as I showed you in terms of these epigenetic, these inhibitors, or um, the fin inhibitor that's being developed for um, neurodegenerative disorders. So if they've already been shown to be safe for human consumption and even already passed phase one and phase two trials, we have a lot of information that we can um, leverage and dose will definitely matter, matter for a particular syndrome. So we're not expecting that the same dose that might be needed for certain medication, for certain disorders will work for opiate use disorders, but at least it brings us, it gives us that, um, it gives us a path to get faster to developing novel medications. So with that, um, it, I know the time is up uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Great talk. So we um, have plenty of plenty of time for questions. I have first one here from uh, Barbara. Why don't you just ask that verbally? Yes. Hi there. Thank you for your um, uh, speech. It, it was awesome. Barbara Morse. I work for the NBC station in Providence, Rhode Island. Could you use CBD along with methadone and other treatment of substance use disorder? Yeah. So we're conducting or we're um, hope to start, it's been a long journey um, to, um, to, to start studies with CBD that will not only be in people who are abstinent. So our first few cl clinical trials with CBD, the people were abstinent, but now we're also doing it in combination with, with methadone or even buprenorphine because to see if it can reduce the amount of methadone that may be needed um, and therefore re reduce the amount of opioids overall that they're taking. and but we know we also carried out animal studies with methadone with CBD and actually it was very effective at reducing again, this Q-induced craving. Methadone didn't even in our animal models normally reduce that Q-induced drug seeking behavior, um, but CBD in combination with methadone improved that. So we think that that combination will be um, important for certain groups of people who might need to stay on methadone, but we can at least reduce the amount of opioids that they need. And did you say these studies are going to be launched or are- Yeah, they will be launched, yeah. Out of your um, yeah. out Mount Sinai? Yes. Okay, up next, Kyle. Hi, doctor. Thanks for making time for us today. Really appreciate it, even if some of the uh, terms were, were new and required. Exactly. <laughs> um, so bringing you back to, to school. I know it's, it's been a bit, but it's refreshing. It's good to exercise that part of the brain. Um, so I want to quickly follow up on Barbara's before I get to my other question. And that when it, 
you mentioned that that a lot of people who try to use or think they're using marijuana or C or CBD specifically in order to um, lead to substitution or or even just to to diminish cravings. Um, you know, you can't necessarily find what you think you're going to get at, at a medical dispensary or otherwise. So the CBD that you folks are using, is that coming from like a, a common seizure strain like Charlotte's Web? Is that something that you're pulling out in the lab yourself? I'm guessing you're not going down to the, to the federal facility in Mississippi all the time. So wh <laughs> where does that come from and how are you certain that you're getting just the CBD versus, versus something that someone might pick up? No, that's a great, a really, really important point. Um, you know, and for research, we have to make sure, and also for medication development, because that's the thing for me right now. I mean, although I want to understand the neurobiology, the goal of my, my work is to get to medication. And so you have to work with a pharmaceutical company who wants to, you know, that has gone through all of the the, the, the GMP, the safety things and how they make it. People think that CBD, you can purchase anywhere and it will be fine. Um, we just have to make sure that what we're giving people, we know what they're getting. And, and, and so we do work with pharmaceutical companies that are making pharmaceutical grade CBD. Um, and you know it doesn't mean perhaps later down the road that companies that really invest are those nutraceutical CBD companies that invest in making better quality products can't be used in the future once we understand the role of CBD. But for now, um, it's definitely pharmaceutical grade. And I, you know, you can never trust everything you can purchase from the internet with CBD. Um, as you know, you know, um, people have found that it's laced even, can be laced with even THC. Um, with lead, with, you know, micro, you know, different microorganisms. So all of that is really important. But yeah, in developing medicine, we work with pharmaceutical companies. And then the, the, the main reason I raised my hand, it's certainly, obviously, we're, you're not quite at the clinical trial stage yet. But when it comes to these things, uh, given how long that process can take, uh, do you see physicians, um, you know, uh, I guess I can't say off the record because this is being recorded, but <laughs> you see off-label uses coming before government approval for, for um, some of the like Alzheimer's meds, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I definitely think that would happen and, but it's going to come back down to data. So as more research comes out that, for example, if one of these fin inhibitors or these epigenetic inhibitors um, work, but work and re are reproduced and they have a dose range that they understand that might be effective, I think that they will be pushed by their patients. You know, we have a lot of people pushing us already for CBD even. And they're like, why can't, you why can't we get that for our psychosis? Why can't we get that for our anxiety? Why can't we get this for our addiction while we're doing research here with it? And yes, so we're not able to give it to patients as a medication, even though CBD is, is obviously um, now FDA approved for epilepsy, especially two rare forms of childhood epilepsy. I think that what physicians need more data. And once there's more, there are more clinical trials that at least um, even if it hasn't gone through the whole FDA process to say, Yes, the FDA has now approved CBD or these epigenetic modifiers for um, opiate use disorder, but there's so much data that has come out from research. I think that physicians will start to do some off-label for those medications, as I said, that have been proven safe. Also that they don't co-react with other medications that their patients may be taking. And that's why I want people, even though I am optimistic, um, I'm optimistic more about CBD because there's less side effects and you know, we understand which medications it can interact with on a negative manner. But all these other things, have, other um, medications I mentioned have not been studied in that detail as yet. So I don't want people to start going out and using them until we have more research uh, available. But I do think that patients, once more data comes out from these clinical trials, as more and more clinical trials, before it even gets years later for the FDA to approve it, for that indication, I think that patients will start pushing their 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 docs, and doctors will start prescribing off 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 label. Thank you.
Okay, and Kyle is from uh, Gray TV in the Washington Bureau. Thanks, Greg. Next, up next is uh, Madeline Beck. Hi hey there, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, like Kyle, I'm, I'm definitely gonna have to rewatch a couple portions where there are heavy vocabulary. <laughs> I, 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 will, I, will, uh, I will still um, give you guys a passing grade for being mm -hmm. able to you know. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, yeah, no, I, I was, I'm with the Mountain West News Bureau. So I report for NPR stations around the Mountain West. Uh, I was just wondering, you specifically looked in a lot of your work at heroin addiction um, and kind of its effects with thin inhibitors and epigenetic inhibitors. And I was just wondering, are you, do you think that more research would have to be done with other kinds of opioids and then other kinds of drugs? Would we just have to look at this research again? No, again, all of you are, are thinking in the right way. So I'm glad to see that our, our, our reporters <laughs> are critical thinkers. So exactly, so you're thinking like scientists. That's exactly what we're doing. So when our, for example, I, I'll, I'll take even CBD. When our first CBD studies came out, other researchers who were studying alcohol looked at in their models and they were able to replicate it with alcohol. People have also replicated the clinical studies with um, smoking in people. So the first thing that we, we try to see is their potential to be impact on other substances. So the same thing for, um, I didn't mention for like the fin inhibitor, actually it's not just in neurodegenerative disorders that's being studied, it's also being studied for alcohol use disorder because preclinical animal models showed that inhibiting that actually reduce alcohol intake, Dorit Ron and UCSF, her studies were really elegant. So, it's not going to be specific to, um, I think, and the same thing for some of the um, epigenetic inhibitors, because addiction in general leads to these long-term changes in these, you know, in these epi epigenetic, um, your, your cells, your DNA are, are being primed to, to react to something differently. So they take over, these tags are reversible. And so these, they're these epigenetic tags, and that's what substance use disorders are in general. And most addictions share this commonality. So they may have a different um, pharmacological action. So cocaine will, you know, inhibit, you know, dopamine um, uptake into the brain. Um, opioids attack the opioid receptors, alcohol, GABA, and, and all these different things. But there is a commonality to some of the neurobiological changes with all substances of abuse. And many people, to be honest, are polysubstance users. So I actually don't mind that if something that we find that may be specific for in our, our the question we're asking for opiate addiction might indeed turn out to help for alcohol use disorder or cocaine use disorder, because we have a problem with all of these and polysubstance use is common and it is one brain. And so these mechanisms, I think that's why I also optimistic about this strategy instead of targeting the pharmacological site where the drugs work to actually look at what really is changing the brain. And that's where you see the commonalities. So a lot of research, basic science research has shown that these systems are important, not for opioids, but for other substances as well. That's, uh, thank you so much. It's, it's good to hear uh, that it's being looked into so many other types of addiction. I guess just really quick as a, as a follow-up with that. I mean, obviously there's other kind of associated addictions like uh, a sugar addiction and things like that. And I, I wonder, it's, I mean, it, it seems that most affect the same parts of the brain, that kind of like feedback circuit. Do you think that this sort of research should go into all types of addiction as far as looking into how to treat areas yeah. where people's anxiety pushes them to overuse anything? Right. I mean, I think that one of the reasons why CBD, I know I'm being um, uh, recorded, but one of the reasons I think that CBD is being effective so far that we see is because of anxiety. And we have a spectrum of anxiety disorders that can go all the way, obviously, pathologically to PTSD. And a lot of this anxiety drive many different disorders that, um, like, you know, this um, uh, addictions, whether not only chemical addictions, but other things and even can drive some aspects of compulsivity. Um, and that's where I think that CBD might be working. So I don't think it's specific to, like I said, the opioid system. I think it is about the neurobiological systems um, pathology that's fundamental to a lot of these 
um, psychiatric um, disorders and anxiety is a huge part of that. So that may be why CBD may be effective on a more global level. The other medications we have to see, but, but I think that that's some, one of the things. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's effective for you know, certain pathological behavioral addictions, but you know, the, at the extreme end, my eating my chocolate and being a little sometimes each night, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if I want to take CBD for that, but, <laughs> but for those, you know. But. Right, right. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so I have a question and then we'll go to Alexis. Um, uh, Two related questions. One from Sunny is uh, is asking, can you please spell the name of the UCSF researcher you mentioned? Oh, okay. And he, oh, Dorit Ron, D-O-R-I-T is our first name and Ron, R-O-N is the second. Okay. And also just kind of related, our fellows here are from all around the country. Are there other researchers, you know, prominent researchers who are studying the same things that, uh, you know, you can maybe uh, list off the top of your head who might be worth who might be uh, nearby for some of our fellows. I mean, who are the other people who are good to reach out to in this field? So, I mean, there are not that many people, uh, unfortunately, who go from the human um, in terms of neuro, but it depends on what you're looking at. So, for example, for those people, individuals who might um, want to um, to look at uh, the the fin inhibitor. In relation to, let me go, you know, um, uh, let's put the name, the fin inhibitor in um, uh, with alcohol use disorder. So they're doing a number of studies at Yale. And, and I think that to me, you know, those, um, the, the Yale group, um, um, Christian Sarin, I'm really, I'm, I'm bad at some of the, um, at some of the, um, the, the, names, but Godfrey Perlson also, um, I think they're doing, um, running the, the, the studies at Yale that, um, and even have for neuroimaging with um, the, the fin inhibitor. So those are people I think that I, I would definitely reach out to as well. Um, I'm Bert, Friedberg Weiss at Scripps in, in um, at Scripps in California. Are, are studying alcohol models with CBD. Um, there, I mean, and the list is growing in terms of CBD in other substance use disorders. I'm happy, Chris, to put together a list and, and, and send to you um, in terms of, yeah. All right, that'd be helpful. Thanks much. Next question to Alexis. Hi, Dr. Heard. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Alexis Winook, and I write for a publication called BrainFacts.org. Uh, I have two questions, if we have time. And my first one is about CBD. Do we know exactly how it's working in the brain? That you said it's reducing the heroin seeking. It's you know reducing cue associated anxiety. Do we know exactly how it's doing that? So that's part of one of the grants that I have to try to um, understand the mechanism. One of the things that you know. Um, all of us in the, the cannabinoid field have been perplexed with CBD or pharmacologists in general, is that it's actually very unique. In, well, not very unique. It's very different from THC. It is not an agonist at the cannabinoid receptor as THC is. It's actually an inverse or we call it a negative allosteric modulator. It's an inverse agonist. So, and it does it very in a weak manner. In fact, it has multiple effects, even um, it's an agonist at one of the serotonin receptors, and that's might be why its anxiety, its anti-anxiety effects are mediated through that. It it seems to tweak the many different systems, but in very mild manner. So normally, when you develop medications, medications are developed to be very potent at either, you know, being a very potent agonist, so binding very much to that receptor, or really being a heavy antagonist blocking that receptor. CBD does not have this heavy hand at, at most of the systems that's been studied in. And that might be why it has very low side effects. Um, and actually, I always say now that, you know, working with CBD has given me a different perspective about medication development. 
because we used to think of these medications, these drugs as dirty drugs that they, you know, they work at so many things, but CBD works at many things, but in a mild manner. And that may be, you know, what we need to do rather than trying to hit the brain heavy, he very heavily with um, our, no our, our usual strategy of developing medicines. Great, thank you. Um, my second question is about um, the transmissibility um, of some of these epigenetic changes that you mentioned. I'm wondering how that, how does that affect the mice's offspring, for instance? Like these, these changes, is that passed on? Are they more likely to wanna, you know, press the lever for heroin? Well, we did a study because I'm masochistic and I say I studied the developmental effects of cannabis in both uh, animal models and humans, but um, I wanted to also see could it impact the next generation. And many years ago, we're slowing down some of those studies because it's very challenging, those studies. But what we did was just to look at THC and we could see that in the offspring of those animals that were exposed to THC, their offspring actually had, especially in the males, I should say, uh, had a higher incidence of self-administering heroin. We actually followed them into their third generation, the great grandkids, and they still showed um, changes in reward sensitivity. So, and we've now been looking at the mechanism by which that occurs through with doing it through the sperm. And it's really fascinating how that happens. But so there is a potential to whatever we all do in your, our lives, um, I don't have kids, so it's you guys who may be impacting the, the, the next generation to remember that, um, that whatever we do, we, we used to think that all of our epigenetic, our history, our environment, we, it actually gets erased when you, the sperm egg meets. However, we thought that most of that got erased and it's only a, a very small percentage that was maintained. We now know that's not the case, but the thing is that there, it's epigenetic. And so even though it has the potential to be transmitted to future generations, it's how each person, each generation is raised. So you can pass certain things along, but if they're raised in a different environment, they may not then develop that particular vulnerability. So it's not the one good thing I think and that people miss about substance use disorders as we're learning more now about the brain, the fact that it's epigenetic that's driving a lot of this means it's reversible. And therefore it's not deterministic that once quote unquote, you know, there was a thing that they used to say once an addict, always an addict. We now know that that is not necessarily the case. And the same thing would go for the transgenerational potential to be transmitted. But, you know, people need to know that the things that they do can impact even on their great grandkids, which is scary. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> to quickly follow up on that, if I could, are you saying, and, and I apologize, I don't have the, the deep understanding that Alexis does on some of this stuff. Are you suggesting that the, the histones that we're talking about here might be passed on in the on or off position? Or are you just saying that those histones exist and that the environment will affect whether it ultimately gets triggered one way or the other? I'm saying that um, that the the certain modifications, not necessarily all of these, the, the specific histones that I showed you for like heroin, I'm saying that some of these epigenetic tags indeed are transmitted. So we, we, we all get the machinery of epigenetics. Um, you, we all have the machinery, but the specific epigenetic modifications, and I, I can tell you guys offline perhaps, but it's not that it is about heroin or cannabis. It's more about what they do to the body. And like coming back to this anxiety state. So, you know, we think of, for example, certain psychiatric disorders being in families, but it's also the families, it's not just genetic, it's the environmental things as well. And so, and you can see that there is a gradient of the pathology and that gradient of the pathology again, comes back to um, these epigenetic, um, um, these epigenetic disturbances that yes, can get transmitted. So it's that, um, and it's, yeah, and it's through changing more, perhaps more globally, stress responsivity, changing more globally, metabolic processes that puts them at risk. Thank you. Okay. 
And with that, we need to draw this session to a close. Dr. Hurd, I want to thank you very much for making the time to come teach our fellows something new. And um, and I and and I suspect that a few of them will probably reach back, reach back out to you to kind of clarify some points as they, if they're going to dive into these topics. No problem. I, I it was good, and I, I know I was bringing you guys back to school. <laughs> <laughs>